Good morning, everybody, and welcome to this training event. We are delighted to welcome each of you to this first in what we hope will be a series of training events for humanities doctoral students across the island of Ireland. I'd also like to welcome all of our panelists for today's webinars. I'm sure you will agree that we have put together a really stellar lineup of speakers, and we're delighted with the response in recent weeks with registrations up until just a few minutes ago. I'd also like to welcome and thank my colleague, Gronya Lynch, who has helped me, especially on the tech side, uh, ahead of today's event. However, before I get to the program, I'd like to say a few words about the IHA itself. The IHA was established in September 2013. As an all-island alliance of humanities scholars and researchers in 11 higher education and research institutions. This includes 10 universities on the island and the Royal Irish Academy, which of course houses and supports the work of the IHA. The IHA enjoys a productive relationship with key stakeholders within the research ecosystem at national and EU level. In 2015, the Alliance was a founding member of EASH, the European Alliance of Social Sciences and Humanities. We have been active members of EASH and are also represented on that body's governing board. We in the IHA are working to showcase and promote the work of the humanities research community across the island and seek to bring a coordinated humanities voice to higher education policy at EU and national level. In November of last year, we launched a strategic vision for the humanities in the 2020s entitled By Imagination We Live, a strategy for the humanities. This document is rooted in the conviction that the wide spectrum of humanities disciplines have a major contribution to make to the most pressing social, political, cultural, technological, and environmental issues of the 21st century. And of course, we will hear more about that from uh, our first panel today. In the context of Brexit, pillar one of the strategy, an all-island vision for the humanities, reminds us of the ongoing importance of the IHA's work as an all-island body that can foster a collaborative network enhancing and promoting the humanities community across the island of Ireland. And today's event, of course, with people registered from uh, each of the institutions across the island really speaks to that strategic aim. And I would encourage attendees to check out the strategy document on the IHA website. As you can see from the programme, in panel one today, we will hear more about the future directions in the humanities from four scholars who are leading experts in their fields, in areas, of course, that really speak to those uh, societal issues outlined in the strategy. Panel two brings together librarians and archivists representing institutions at national and local level to discuss the range of excellent services and resources that are available to us as humanities researchers. So in order to ensure that we keep moving in a timely manner, I will now hand over to the IHA chair, Dr. Neve Nagawan of the University of Limerick, who will introduce and chair our first panel. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, and thanks so much to Dr. Mel Farrell, um, the IHA director for all of his stellar work as ever um, on putting this event together. Um, my name is Neve McGowan. I'm uh, delighted to be the chair of the Irish Humanities Alliance uh, at, uh, this year. And I'm bringing this event to you uh, with the board of the Irish Humanities Alliance, um, all of our members and uh, my co-chair, uh, Professor Chris Williams from UCC, who will be uh, chairing the afternoon session. Um, so first of all, I just really want to say thank you very much for being here today. Um, I wish I could see you all. Um, I really genuinely do. Um, events like this are so important for community. Um, I'm delighted to see that I actually recognize some of the names um, in the attendees. We have 78 people with us, which is fantastic. Um, and hello particularly to some of the postgrads who are here from my own home institution, the University of Limerick. And I, I can see already that there is a huge range of disciplines represented from across the doctoral research community. So it's, it's brilliant to have you. Um, we really want to connect um, with the community of doctoral researchers um, 
the, the community of humanities doctoral researchers across the island, you are a really important group um, in terms of the future of the humanities, in terms of humanities research. And the Irish Humanities Alliance needs to uh, be connecting with you, to be listening to you and to be supporting you um, as core members of the humanities research community. Um, I hope everybody has a nice uh, cup of coffee with them um, this morning because we're going to have a great session, uh, two fantastic panels. Um, first of all, I just want to commend everybody for keeping going uh, in such a tough year for research. We've all been missing many of the social aspects of our work that are so important whether it's conferences or meeting friends or colleagues for lunch in the middle of a day at the archives. And I really look forward to when we can all be together again. Uh, that kind of community and camaraderie and sense of connection is so important for research. And um, so again, thank you for coming today um, and being part of being part of this event. I think we're trying and, and in many ways, so many institutions are coming up with ways to continue and um, to create that sense of community and connection. So just to say the aim of today's session is to introduce you as a, a community of doctoral researchers to some of the Irish Humanities Alliance working groups and some of the emerging and future directions in humanities research. We wanted today very much to be about networking and we felt that connecting our doctoral community with these working groups would be a valuable first step in letting you see the different kinds of work that we do and um, I suppose letting you see what might be of value and interest to yourselves and your own projects as they're emerging. This afternoon, as Mel mentioned, um, which will be chaired by my colleague, Professor Chris Williams from UCC, will focus on a pressing issue for many researchers in the humanities, accessing and working with libraries and archives during a period of restrictions. Although the vaccine is thankfully en route and hopefully will be available to many of us soon, it is likely that we'll need to be working with these restrictions for some time yet. So this hopefully will be, I'm sure, I'm sure will be a very valuable session um, connecting with key stakeholders and partners in humanities researchers, um, in humanities research rather, our, our library and archives um, uh, staff and experts. However, one of our key aims today is to connect with you as a community and to get feedback about what kinds of training events you would find valuable. So we very much designed uh, today's event, having listened to our own doctoral students and, and communities of, of doctoral students in our own institutions. But essentially, this is, this is a first step to understanding what you need and what we can do more for you uh, so that we can understand what, uh, what the IHA can do to continue to support and connect with our doctoral community. So if you have suggestions or ideas, I'd be really grateful if you could put them in the chat um, or, and we'll also be circulating a survey following the event today with requests for further ideas. So, you know, you know best what you need as a community and the Irish Humanities Alliance has a fantastic network of scholars across the island. So it's our hope that we can put, that we can work together to support doctoral researchers with the resources and the networks that we have. We have a fairly tight schedule today, so each of our speakers for this morning will have 10 minutes, leaving us with some time for Q&A at the end. We're going to use the chat box for Q&A. Uh, we're all Zoom experts at this point, um, so just pop your any questions or comments that you have there, um, and uh, we can address those uh, at the end of each of the four sessions. So what I'm going to do now is just briefly introduce our speakers. Um, if you want to look at their list of publications and projects, you can look at their individual uh, institutional web pages. I'm just going to give a brief introduction to them here. Um, I'm going to introduce them all four speakers now, and then uh, when we get started, each speaker will follow the next, and we will keep those uh, questions to the end. But the great thing about the chat is that you can, I suppose, write down the questions as they occur to you, um, and then we can come to them at the end. So first of all, um, our first speaker today is Dr. Timothy Stott. Um, uh, Dr. Stott is Associate Professor in Modern and Contemporary Art History at Trinity College Dublin. Um, he's the Chair of the Environmental Humanities Working Group for the Irish Humanities Alliance. And among his many publications, uh, his book, uh, Nervous Systems, Art, Systems and Politics since the 1960s is forthcoming um, in 2021 with Duke University Press. So our second speaker, is Dr. Kira Barnock, who is Senior Lecturer in History at the University of Limerick. And among her um, many uh, projects, she is the main principal investigator of the Irish Record Linkage 1864-1913 project. 
um, and is also uh, the principal investigator of the IRC um, Laureate Project, which is death and burial data. Um, so working in the area of the medical humanities and the digital humanities, and she's representing um, the IHA Working Group on the Medical Humanities here today. Dr. Donald Mulligan is a lecturer and researcher at Dublin City University's School of Communications. He's a member of the working group on the digital humanities for the Irish Humanities Alliance and has co-founded and is currently um, a member of DCU's interdisciplinary digital research group and more details are available at hybridresearch.org if you're interested in that. And finally, Dr. Ali Fitzgibbon is a lecturer in the School of Arts, English and Languages at Queen's University, Belfast. And Ali has combined research and arts management with independent producing, programming and consulting, consultancy in the cultural sphere um, with over 25 years of experience in that area. And Ali's research has been focused on issues of precarity um, and artistic work, um, looking at the field of management and leadership in the cultural and creative industries across the UK examining the influence of public policy and public management on cultural sector behaviour. So thank you so much to all of our speakers for taking the time in an extremely busy semester to come and speak with us today. And so I'm now going to hand over to Dr. Timothy Stott. So thank you very much. Thank you, Neve, And thank you also, of course, to Mel and Chris and Gronia for organising this event today. Um, I think it promises to be very timely and exciting. And um, Hugely informative event. And I know that despite everything, it's still a very exciting time to be a humanities researcher. Um, and hopefully, some of what we're going to introduce you to this morning will um, confirm that to you. I'm going to put up some images. I'll explain them a wee bit later on. Uh, they relate to my own research. Um, first of all, I'm just going to give an outline of what the environmental humanities might be. Um, secondly, I'll give a sense of what its ambitions might be um, in the near future. Thirdly, then, I'm going to look at the aims of the environmental humanities working group, what we're trying to do over the next few years. And then fourthly, lastly, I'll just speak very briefly about um, some of my own current um, research projects. So I guess in the broadest terms, environmental humanities scholarship is scholarship as if nature mattered. This is a phrase coined by um, the design historians Chettle Fallon and Finn Arne Jorgensen a couple of years ago. Um, it responds to a renewed importance of humanities scholarship in response to the environmental crisis that we face. And I always come back to a quote from the American anthropologist Anna Singh this is from a talk from 2015 at Barnard College in New York. And she states, for the first time in my lifetime, and Singh is in her late 60s, natural scientists are looking for help from humanists in knowing the world. So there's some, new, some renewed importance, some renewed agency, perhaps, to humanities scholarship and humanities knowledge. The environmental humanities, of course, is an interdisciplinary field. It's gathered around, perhaps less around disciplinary distinctions and more around what Bruno Latour calls a matter of concern. That matter of concern, of course, is the environmental crisis, or perhaps what we should now call the environmental catastrophe through which we are living. And it's really concerned with how the arts, with how history, languages, philosophy, politics, law, literature, music, cultural studies, film studies, anthropology, cultural geography. I'm sure I've left out some, some disciplines, some sub-disciplines sub in that list, but how they can respond to this crisis. I guess that there's a general feeling that to address this crisis, it's not enough just to address a deficit in information. This deficit in information, which can often be one of the guiding ambitions of scientific research, to produce more information about the world, to produce more information about future scenarios and their consequences. This doesn't seem to address the pervasive cynical reason that we still face, which is that people know, but do it anyway. It also doesn't necessarily um, address the uneven responsibility and the uneven consequences this crisis. 
as we found, for instance, in the recent protest by the Gilets Jaunes in France. So, in, again, in response to this understanding that the deficit information is not enough, the humanities, the environmental humanities, that study the histories, the narratives, the fictions, and the representations that have both led us to this crisis and which might lead us out of this crisis. Again, environmental problems cannot be solved by science and technology alone. In the broadest terms then, what the environmental humanities is trying to do is to offer both a critique and, and this is, I think a really crucial point, to offer both critique and constructive knowledge in understanding the nature of the environmental problems that face us. To offer, for instance, historical perspectives on sciences and technologies, their agendas, their ambitions, their interests, their failures, as well as their successes. To look at their techniques, to look at how knowledge is disseminated, to look at how they formulate and how they seek to tackle the increasingly wicked problems that face them. Another of his ambitions, of course, is to work with scientists and translate STEM into STEAM in a very real and meaningful way. To develop new ways of thinking, new modes of civic engagement, for instance to push for changes in policy, taxation, environmental governance. Also to address the difficulties of interdisciplinary research and training, of how to redraw, if necessary, the boundaries of expertise. As much as we might enjoy discussions of flat ontologies and interspecies entanglement, we also need to reconsider the perhaps more slightly more sobering um, phenomena of curricular funding, knowledge production, accreditation, pedagogy, and so on. And this leads me then to the aims of the Environmental Humanities Working Group. It was set up last year. Um, I'm the chair of the group until 2023. So what we're trying to do at the moment, really our primary aims are just to provide a platform environmental humanities research, debate, and advocacy across the island of Ireland. To establish a network of environmental humanities expertise, to connect this network then to partners in Europe and beyond. And again, to advance a shared set of concerns among humanities scholars. Lastly then, I'll just try and explain some of these slides. My own research interests, again, I'm an art historian or historian of art and design, really. I'm just completing a monograph on Buckminster Fuller's World Game and its different versions, which challenge players to redistribute planetary resources more equitably. This was first established in the late 1960s. So my monograph studies its different architectures, its displays, its use of information design, its use of maps, charts, etc., its gameplay. And then what you see here is just a collection of different images from the visual culture of Earth system science. And this is my current area of research. I'm a, it's only very early days in this research project. But what I'm planning to do is to study the visualizations of the Earth system over the past 60 years or so, especially to look at its information design. So again, to look at its charts, maps, graphs, plans, diagrams. And to bring the analytical tools of art history and visual studies to bear upon this visual culture of science. These visualizations, for instance, have an iconography of semiotics. They're central to the construction and the evolution of climate science's epistemic culture. As technical images, they act in the world. They don't just represent, they actually act. They act in helping us to reason about the past and the future, about future scenarios, about trends and uncertainties, and again, about responsibilities and consequences. They also influence who acts, how we might act, and indeed, of course, as these are mostly visualizations, different visualizations of the planet, what we act upon. 
Um, just to explain the images, on the top left you have um, a composite of 450 photographs produced by the Tiros 9 satellite in February 1965, really the first, if you like, world photograph. On the bottom left you have, you have Hans Joachim Schellnhuber's simplification from 1999 of the so-called Bretherton diagram of the Earth system. Uh, produced in 1986. You probably can't see it here, but one of those boxes includes basically human activities. So human activities are kind of black box. Um, obviously, there's a lot of work to be done, and indeed a lot of work has been done to update this diagram since 1986. Uh, on the top right, you see a map of global impacts due to climate change from the IPCC fourth assessment report of 2007. And on the bottom right, you see a more recent diagram of trajectories of the Earth system out of the Holocene, an article published by Will Stepping and others in 2018. Again, my point is that these have these belong to a visual culture, and they're often presented as more or less neutral or objective representations of the Earth system. But again, I would say they have an iconography, they have a history. Um, and they make use of any number of different conventions of information design, of colouring, of perspective, etc. So that's about it. Um, again, I'm, I'm happy to finish there and happy to field any questions on the environmental humanities that anyone might have um, later on. So good morning, everybody. And uh, just a quick thank you to uh, Mel, Leo and Gornia for the invitation and for their um, assistance this morning. So I'm going to begin um, by uh, giving you a brief definition of the medical humanities. I will outline the networks and journals for medical humanities and how I establish my reputation in the field. And I'm going to conclude then by uh, illustrating how I use medical humanities in my work by providing a flavour of my research on uh, tuberculosis in modern Ireland. Now, the medical humanities have been variously defined over the years. In a nutshell, it involves embedding humanities subjects and methods in medical education at an undergraduate level. It has gained some traction here in Ireland uh, at undergraduate level um, and also in CPD or continuing professional uh, development context. Um, Professor Jay McNaughton described it in the professional context as a transformation of uh, health evidence uh, based to the study of human experience. I think it's probably a bit more uh, established in Ireland from a, a research perspective. And it, uh, there are several, I might add, research funding opportunities from top down and bottom up funding instruments. I'm not going to name all the different agencies here now, but a medical humanities approach can be fruitfully applied to applications that touch on the sustainable development goals, where humanities can, of course, serve society quite well. I've been involved in um, the medical humanities for, for the last 13 years or so in a number of different ways. I've organized four conferences, all of which have won competitive funding, which has helped me to build networks. I've been teaching medical history since 2007 to history students at the University of Limerick. And I've been involved in the medical humanities short module at our graduate education medical school since 2010. Apart from the history of medicine and nursing journals, I have published in um, dedicated medical humanities journals. And to give you an idea of the interdisciplinary space, I began researching the diaries of Sean O'Reardon, an Irish language coach um, diary, in February uh, 2013. I literally just began the research then, and the article was published online, online first, in September of that year, which is a remarkably fast turnaround. We're more used to in the order of between one and three years um, as a historian. I'll come back to O'Reardon in a moment. But just to kind of uh, finish off on the various different um, fingers and pies that I have, um, I'm a member of the Association of Medical Humanities um, Council uh, since 2015. I'm a former associate editor of Medical Humanities. Um, I acted in that capacity from 2016 to 2018. I'm currently a member of the editorial board. There's also the Journal of Medical Humanities, which is the Springer Journal. And the typical turnaround days are between 160 and 400 days, depending on which journal um, you're working for. 
currently on the editorial board of Medical Humanities as well. With regard to my own research, I am fascinated by the history of medical power and how it operates in society, the social process of medicalization, health inequality, and how that is gendered. In my current Irish Research Council Laureate Award, I examined, I examined these power differentials in Ireland from 1864 to 1922. And we're currently busy breaking down aggregate data to its most granular level. And in so doing, um, we aim to understand the social inequalities of health. And here's a flavor of how one socially disadvantaged area of Dublin fared with respect to respiratory disease in the last quarter of 1901. Many of these deaths are sudden. Average life expectancy is 32 as against 59 in professional classes to the south of the city, literally three miles away. I'm working with Professor Tiziana Margaria to apply computer science thinking to historical big data to aid our analysis of these data from 1864 to 1922. Tuberculosis, tuberculosis was a pervasive and highly communicative disease that was rampant in Irish society and it predominantly attacked the, the lungs, but it can attack any part of the body. Even after the advent of germ theory and bacteriology in the 1880s, its long and strong associations with social class and poverty were impossible to sever. I studied the Irish language as part of my undergraduate degree and was inspired by the work of Professor Sean O'Quillon, who was, um, I was very lucky to be lectured by at the uh, University College Cork. And he was also um, a Sean O'Weardon's biographer and very dear friend. In O'Weardon's diaries of almost 40 years, we can track pre and post drug therapy Ireland and the appalling treatment of sufferers in long and short terms. In the first article I published in 2013, I focused on translation to develop an understanding of tuberculosis from the sufferer's perspective. And I used his diaries to track how he felt. Come death. It struck heights me. I am a bad sort. His reduction to poverty without help, without money, 10 pounds left, that's all. And Nilo just bought a farm for 400 pounds. Bear in mind here, he was 34 when he was in rigors of this disease. He talks about his emasculation by disease, his loss of selfhood and self esteem. But during this period of illness, he became recognized as one of the most important poets of modern Irish. I'm going to try, I'm going to attempt to uh, play a poem from, for you. It was translated um, um, by uh, Professor Paul Muldoon. York recently, and I'm hoping that this works. Freedom. I'm going down among the ordinary people. I'm going to get up on my own two feet and go right down to where they're gathered tonight. I'm going down in search of some good old servitude instead of this poisonous freedom stuff that turns out to be so grim and gruff. She's a mask, the Nina is I'll go looking for the company of those who could never see the point of being cut off and free. I listen to the two cents worth they'll rearrange like so much spare change. I've had thoughts springing of late in my skull, these thoughts springing of late, unruly and intemperate. But I'll try to give my attention to things that are all tied up, to every dogged idea and its pup. Yup, to power, 
the contract. Slurry God called the other dinner, nor clacked real in seership. Called the lowest is that poem was called uh, Sirsha, and as you can imagine, it has been misappropriated in social media, but it actually talks about misanthropic tendencies and it attempts to reintegrate into society following the social isolation of disease. In my second article um, that I, 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 I wrote on Shona Rirdon, I took a more of a narrative medicine approach to his end of life diaries to, to develop my ideas around patienthood and the long sufferer who was forgotten in the post-drug therapy era after the sanatoria of the earlier 20th century had repurposed into general medical facilities he spoke about being lumped together with the cancer crowd. And he remarked, my likes or comrades are in the clay now. That is where I should be. His experience is no different to long sufferers of HIV and the ramifications of long COVID have yet to be developed or understood. Just to conclude, I hope that my whistle stop, whistle -stop tour this morning has provided somewhat of a compelling case for how the critical analytical skills of the humanities are relevant and necessary to solve some of the greatest challenges to global inequalities. So I say to you early career scholars, be brave and think big. You belong at the table. And if you feel imposter syndrome, collaborate and establish your networks in that way. Join the AMH, come to Limerick next year to our conference, but also be kind and gracious in your path. And I will conclude by thanking our, the special collections librarian, Eugene Roach at University College Dublin, who might think tucks these archives into bed at night in my little head, but also I'd like to thank uh, Paul Muldoon and Irla O'Leonard who have permitted my use of their work. It just goes to show if you write to people, you will, you'll find generosity there. So I'll leave it at that. Hello, good morning, everybody. Um, I'm Donald Mulligan. I'm um, an assistant professor at the School of Communications in DCU, a member of, of the interdisciplinary research group there. And I'm on uh, the board of the Irish Humanities Alliance and, and particularly uh, in the Digital Humanities Working Group. And so I wanted to briefly talk about these uh, things this morning and to uh, take you through some of the uh, ways in which you can use these resources and, and others uh, hopefully within your own work. I'm very happy to hear from you and my email and uh, Twitter handle are there if they're uh, any use. My, my Twitter handle probably less so for academic purposes and more me just ranting about the Eurovision and various things like that, but uh, we all need those breaks too. Uh, but I'm a researcher of, of Twitter in general and I, I do that research at DC School of Communications. And I suppose that's initial um, kind of situation within a school of communications has been a beneficial thing, I suppose, for getting started in the humanities in underscoring the inherent interdisciplinarity of uh, the, the field that, that it is. It, it started me in the space in a field uh, communications that is already so intrinsically linked to many, many others and requires connectivity to media studies, to, to political science and political studies, to methods from computer science, uh, education, cultural studies, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. And Often in the early stages of, of your research, and especially at the point when you're um, finishing your, your PhD in particular, which I, I did a few years ago myself, you can become very embedded within your own field and within the, the kind of methods and paradigms of the, the place that you come from and the place that you're becoming the expert you're becoming uh, within. And I, I suppose, was, was lucky in that uh, my work within a school of communications and my employment within that school of communications and research there afterwards uh, emphasized for me the ability to uh, step beyond that and to look for that opportunity that there, there is in interdisciplinary work in both methodology, first of all, but also in, you know, at the paradigm level, at the philosophical level of new ways of looking at information, of conceiving of 
uh, you know, what values we might have or, or might gain from, from sharing things with our colleagues. And so uh, that kind of work is, is ongoing in, in my particular school and I'd welcome any um, interest or connection that you might have. And uh, I'm very, very happy to, to discuss uh, research and, and things going on within the school. Part of what we're doing there uh, is um, and just trying to, to start a formal uh, network called the IDRG, the Interdisciplinary Digital Research Group. You'll find our, our website at hybridresearch.org, which is um, a kind of a collaborative, a collaborative space for this kind of inter and transdisciplinary inquiry. And so we've held some events and we've, uh, um, you know, tried to, to mostly self networking initially and then kind of events like this, uh, doctoral training events and things like that for uh, for scholars and we're trying to build out a network within the humanities and social sciences where we can share perspectives and theories where we can uh, compare methodologies and we're planning a, a, some work groups in the, the near future in, in the early new year and also to set up a kind of reading group to, to do some smaller book-based events we had a really successful event back in in the start of this year just pre-covid actually and we've kind of struggled in that time since as lots of us have with with providing a space for people to collaborate and get together. And it's so much more difficult to uh, be doing uh, something like this over Zoom as we are this morning than if we have, you know, the the, the cup of coffee from the, a big burka boiler that we can <laughs> sip and chat to one another afterwards. And it's difficult to make those connections. But in other ways, we have new opportunities. There's a very large amount of people uh, able to attend today. There's a lot more that we can do with some of the digital technologies that, that connect us. So Partly, we have to be critical about the role of those technologies in mediating what we do, and we have to struggle in some ways to find the opportunities there. But that's something we should be doing together, I suppose, and that's what IDRG is trying to do, is just connect people whose um, various areas of research in the humanities and the social sciences can benefit one another. And we've had some really uh, interesting uh, work coming together within that, that space already. On the IHA board, I'm part of the Digital Humanities Working Group, and that working group has uh, really taken an increased role, I suppose, in, in the, the recent months because of the, the role that digital humanities are now uh, taking during COVID-19. This, this period of restriction is a period where we're more reliant on those tools, we're more reliant on digital access, and often the humanities are, are left behind or locked out of parts of their, their work or necessary resources uh, to what they're doing because of, uh, you know, historically, maybe there, there being less development of some of those uh, digital uh, resources or, or those forms of access. And so the working group is very concerned with that. And that's one of the things that we're, uh, we're looking at in the short term is, is trying to, uh, I suppose, get the word out about the, the uh, work of, of the humanities in Ireland, about the way in which uh, these changes in access are affecting people's ability to work um, and to, to try and, and uh, develop uh, I suppose supports for for one another across campuses with, uh, within the island of Ireland, and also to to just uh, publicise the the work that's happening in these spaces in the humanities. There's a longer term uh, project that we're we're undertaking as well at the moment that I'd really wanted to to talk about this morning because it's one that I think you as uh, scholars in this field have a, a, a huge uh, ability to contribute to this, and we really need to, to start hearing from people doing this. And that's on trying to develop a policy document on ethical practices within uh, digital humanities in Ireland. And this is an area that the, the ethics of this space is a difficult one in many ways that we, we deal when we're uh, doing our work in digital humanities and, and uh, within the, the social sciences too, in lots of new forms of participation in, in our research online. So we're, we're bringing people into what we're doing in, in new ways. We're especially reliant, I suppose, on public data and quasi-public data. So data that exists in a kind of a, a gray area in many cases. Social media data is a good example of this that I use in my own work on uh, studying Twitter, where it's not quite clear whether people realize that how public their utterances are, realize the way in which their, their stuff might be used and reused and reanalyzed. And part of what we do as, as scholars, I think, uh, should be to, to try and reconcile these things, to discuss them, to develop uh, our thinking around the, the ethics of this area. But we also have a, a very strong role, I think, in making other people uh, more aware of the research that we do and making other people aware of the imp implications of the, the sharing of data that they're doing or the, or the way in which we might use and reuse that data. So there's connection here with data protection, with media literacy and data literacy uh, across the, the space. And it's something that many of you within the, the areas that you come from uh, will be able to contribute to. And I, I really hope that people might get in touch about uh, their interest within uh, the, this kind of uh, space of ethics and digital humanities uh, with our, our working group. I was asked this morning to uh, to talk about some of the uh, 
uh, kind of future directions in the humanities. And those two things, I mean, none of these will surprise you given what I've just said, I suppose. Um, but the, the two things that I, I really wanted to, to signpost, in, in my opinion, for the, the digital humanities is this, firstly, this increase in the scope and the relevance um, of uh, digital humanities generally, but the, also the, the um, interdisciplinary component of it uh, within these spaces. So both within humanities disciplines themselves, there's a lot more um, cross-pollination of work, and then indeed further afield, um, we have a huge amount of opportunity. And in the last year, uh, I had a, a few kind of very odd but useful um, experiences in research that, that point to this. I uh, was, was recently involved with uh, publishing a, a paper um, that's uh, in geology, and it happened because I am uh, married to a, a geologist from uh, Trinity and discussing the kinds of uh, research that I was doing at the time, which was intended very much for the analysis of Twitter, uh, I discovered uh, with my partner that it's pretty useless, in fact, the, the method that I was using for, for what I want to do, but extremely useful for uh, dating minerals. And so it turned out that the collaboration across these two things, of wildly different fields, led to a very fruitful uh, method of analysis within his space. And so we've a continued collaboration in terms of our methodology there. And these kind of things happen serendipitously a lot of the time. I mean, it's, you know, marrying somebody to get a, a co-publication with them is a pretty long way to go for, <laughs> for an authorship and not really a sustainable model for, for developing your, your academic career and your publications. But it is that serendipity of who you know and what access you have to people that, to work with that really facilitates that. And so if it's not the person who's uh, working in the kitchen during COVID with you, uh, you have to find these other ways to get connected to people. And so that's what IDRG wants to do is, is to try and uh, create events like this one today online, but perhaps with smaller groups where we can introduce ourselves to one another, where we can talk about our work. And really crucially there, I think there's philosophy to be shared there as well as methodology. A lot of the, the workshops that we've been involved in recently or that I've seen and um, kind of uh, discussed in, in the past while have tended to focus on sharing methods. And often those methods are digital methods from the computer sciences that are, are kind of being offered as, as training. And I think there's a step that we can take back from that to look at paradigms themselves and the ways in which we think about knowledge and its value and how other uh, disciplines can bring very, very different ways of looking at uh, knowledge and looking at idea building, looking at ontology and epistemology to us. And that can be hugely useful in our work. I had a fantastic moment uh, of well, hour, I suppose, of discussion recently on the projected work that myself and, and some colleagues are, are putting together for a funding application um, across uh, different institutions. And uh, some colleagues from um, the University of Stavanger in Norway were joining us and they were linguists. And they were talking about uh, a kind of reframing of some of what we were doing based on linguistic determinism. And the, the, you know, those of you who are familiar either from the field of linguistics with that worker who saw the really brilliant 2016 film Arrival, that fantastic uh, sci-fi work will be familiar perhaps with the, the sapir Whorf conjecture and the idea of linguistic determinism of how that might shape our ideas and our ability to comprehend the world and think differently. And those ideas really completely reframed our research project. They were kind of coming to us from left field, but they were there because of that interdisciplinarity that uh, happened to occur within that project. So that that's ability for a different um, sub-discipline of the humanities to just bring a very, very different uh, way of looking at the same information and uh, um, new opportunities, I suppose, in how we might uh, you know, set up the paradigm for the research that we're doing. The other thing that I think is very important to the future direction of the humanities is the centrality of the digital within it. So, I mean, we're seeing, of course, in, in COVID, the digital in terms of facilitation and communication, uh, you know, it's, it's stepping in to allow us to access things in those cases, and there's difficulties in some. It's facilitating this kind of communication that we're involved with uh, this morning. But very importantly, also, it's there in education, too. So we're, we're having to think about, and we need to be critical about, the way in which um, the digital tools that we're currently using and that I'm currently speaking to you over now are assisting, but also getting in the way of our ability to educate and our ability to uh, participate in humanities teaching and learning. And so we have a role as scholars and researchers to, uh, you know, to, to work in our areas and to collaborate with others, but also to teach and to, to spread our ideas, to bring in people into uh, the, the circle with us and to, to um, collaborate with them. And there's, you know, we're, we're moving, I suppose, at the moment out of a mode of crisis that we had initially when COVID set in to just get something working to one now where we're sort of bedding in for the next year or so. And we need to think about making that work as well as it can. And I think that's where digital tools and methods are, are coming into their, their own, but there's it's a place where we need to be critical about their use. And of course, that criticality finally brings me to the discussion I, I mentioned earlier about the ethics of this work. 
So there's a huge pace of change in the humanities brought about by digital tools within it, digital methodologies, digital forms of collaboration. And so they, they demand our attention and they demand our contribution uh, to a discussion around the ethics of those. And that's something, as I said, that really is an aim of the, the IHA's working group over the next uh, 12 to 18 months, in which I would really welcome any of you who are working in these areas or who want to get involved to, to get in touch with me, because uh, this is something I think we'll, we'll all need to work together on if we're going to, to make the best of it. So I hope we can discuss some of the, the rest in the Q&A, but uh, I'll leave it there and uh, allow the rest of my colleagues uh, time to speak. Thank you. I'm coming to this as, uh, as Maeve said in her introduction, as somebody who comes from about 25 years working in the arts and cultural sector and moved into uh, research practice in the last kind of four or five years. So um, for those who are sitting kind of listening as doctoral students, I got my PhD about kind of less than 18 months ago, but have ended up working full time in a university. So my my kind of my sense of where I'm sitting as a researcher is still, as I would say, very unformed or still evolving. So actually listening to other people talking, I'm still kind of in this moment of kind of hunger and excitement and looking at where can I connect and how do I open up to this? And this is kind of what I wanted to talk about today in terms of the future of humanities research. And it kind of picks up on threads that everybody else has been talking about is this kind of idea of openness and inherent interdisciplinarities. So what I wanted to kind of uh, pose to you was this idea of um, having a question. So there is um, a practice that Liz Lerman, anybody who's familiar with dance um, and the study of dance um, came up with, which was uh, her critical response process, which was a system for examining and thinking about the creation of artistic work. And in and the way that we crit critiqued the work, we would ask, I have a question, would you like to hear it? Um, and the idea was that the person who was creating the work had the moment to say, no, thanks, I don't really want to hear it. But if they did, they had to be prepared to change the original artistic work. And so what I wanted to kind of suggest today was that in terms of thinking about the future of humanities, what we really needed to think about was what bit of ourselves and our own research, how reflexive are we in thinking about why are we doing this work? What is it we want to bring about? What is the change we want to create? And so kind of maybe connecting with some of what uh, Timothy was saying in terms of our place and thinking about kind of future radical change in terms of environmental changes, thinking about the effect of COVID-19. Where do we sit in that? And how do we think about this knowledge and how do we process knowledge? So um, my background, I suppose, um, in coming from largely a performing arts background and my research is mainly around the role of the artist and the role of the artist as a freelancer, um, precarious labor and how we, uh, how we consider the systems that are at play that create cultural work, but also create the conditions of that cultural work. So these are concerns of kind of equality and ethics and decision-making. Um, and my practice is to take kind of leadership and management studies into the field of cultural production. So this field of arts management and cultural policy which largely evolved since the 1960s is still a relatively new field. And we're still quite kind of theorizing around um, what we think of it, how we bring in other fields, how we bring in other practices. Um, and so quite regularly, we find ourselves working in an in interdisciplinary context. And as much as Donald said, the field is largely, it is inherently interdisciplinary. So it, very regularly, we end up working with social scientists, with people in cultural studies, people who've come from a background in languages, as well as people who have practice-based research in the fields of um, uh, drama, theatre, visual art, and increasingly new technologies. And these fields are convergent with other areas when we look at the wider study of creative industries, cultural geography, and the emerging cultural ecologies discourse. So starting to say which field you are in becomes very difficult. And I think that's an inherent problem or challenge of interdisciplinary work and interdisciplinary fields, but one that offers certain opportunities and advantages that I think are relevant for today and the situation that we find ourselves in now. Um, one aspect that I think is quite interesting is that when we, um, I would come to this as a researcher of contemporary practice. So my work has largely looked in the kind of present day and looking at how the current situation is affected by or influenced by um, 
systems of policy and systems of management and theories of management. So in doing so, when we hit 2020 and everything that's happened, and as we know, the, um, the cultural sector has largely been quite seriously damaged by um, COVID-19 and is you know, the first to close and the last, likely to be the last to reopen. Where my research was intending to go was to propose that there needed to be radical changes to systems of inequality and systems of precarity. But then suddenly you hit with a global pandemic where there is that radical change. So the question is, how does your research change to think about what should happen next? What does recovery look like? Um, and do, because I had come from a practice background, the instinctive response is to start looking to try and fix the system, to start looking at what is it that you can influence as a researcher that will affect more positive changes so that you can try and address some of the problems. And this presents you with certain, um, I suppose, challenges of where do you sit as a researcher? How far do you go into the field? And how far do you remain, to a certain extent, slightly outside it? And again, this kind of reflexivity, what is it you want to change? What is the question you want to ask? What, it, what do other people want to hear? And are they prepared to work with you to affect change? Um, this connects with where, um, I suppose, Keith Grint, who's a, a researcher in kind of um, a social enterprise talks about in every decision you make, somebody wins and somebody loses. So when you are looking at this as a researcher, who is winning and losing by the choices you are making and what is informing your choices? So as, a, uh, as an academic who has come from practice, what I found myself sitting in in 2020 was having had a background in consultancy work and then moving into research this converged to be asked to um, respond to uh, governmental planning, to get involved in promoting and advocating for the conditions that artists were facing, to step into certain kinds of advisory roles, but also to step into debates that were challenging um, poor decisions in the parts of government. And you then have in, alongside that institutions such as the academy, which are encouraging you to think about how do you promote your university? How do you advance the university's desire to achieve impact? And this leaves you sitting in quite an uncomfortable chair of what is the best thing to do? So these raise ethical and moral decisions. Um, I kind of, um, I'm sorry I can't slowly show you my slides because I'm feeling a little bit thrown by it, but um, I would, I think that as you go forward through your doctoral research, what I would suggest is um, critical in this is that you think about where can your research bring you to, to help you inform kind of the change that is going to happen in wider society. Um, questions that are currently arising within the field, the wider field of cultural industries and creative economy research is how do we define and reimagine the sustainability and inclusive inclusivity of cultural production work and cultural production activity? How do we think about making a fairer society? And how do we maybe not waste a good pandemic? How do we affect radical change when the systems are already interrupted? Um, how do we affect change in the broken systems? And what is the role of the academy in that? And one aspect that has come up in some of the work that I'm working on in terms of rapid response research is how quickly can the academy respond to the change that is needed? So in terms of rapid response research and looking at the role of freelancers in, say, the performing arts sector, which is where I'm currently uh, working, um, how do we, how quickly can we accelerate our research processes and what is the damage that we do to our own research practice in return? Um, what are the long-term implications of neoliberalism and capitalism? What are the, and the false uh, resilience discourses on who can be creative? How do we create, create fairer systems for creative participation and inclusion? And how does that affect the way in which we think about what we are researching and how we disseminate that research? How do we define expertise? How do we define labor? And how do we define professionalism in future cultural and creative work? Why does this matter? Um, and very recently, one of the pieces of work I've been doing is with uh, Yanis Sulakis, who's an ethnomusicologist here at Queen's University. And we, instead of working with on, on a project around kind of uh, precarity and research and uh, looking at COVID-19, we actually persuaded our funders to let us pay freelance artists to work with us, to work in a collaborative sense, 
And this makes us rethink what we talk about when we talk about who is the expert in the conversation and what is the equality that we embed in our research? What is the ethical relationship with the people who are beneficiaries of our work, participants of our work, but also collaborators with us in our research? And how do we redefine that? Um, another aspect that I think we need to, we are looking at within this kind of broad field of arts management and cultural policy, and also within cultural industries is how does arts, culture and creative creativity play a part in the discourse of post-growth economics, um, the greener society, and connecting to what Timothy was saying earlier, you know, kind of how do you make that intersection, but also think how do you change the systems of production? How do you um, adjust the ways that we theorize the management of cultural production to um, recognize the impact of the industry itself on uh, the wider economy and how do we resist these kind of economic discourses that are encouraging mass production, um, mass internationalization, the effects of globalization, and how do you rethink and reframe cultural production in more environmental terms? Um, so I suppose the um, key, key aspects of the future of this particular aspect of humanities research, research that I think are kind of coming or that I can see in terms of where our field is going is that increasingly the field is looking at these um, ways of looking at adaptive, collaborative, more inclusive research strategies and practices um, connecting not just in an interdisciplinary sense between the disciplines within the academy, but looking at interdisciplinarity as a connection between academia and practice or praxis. Um, how do we theorize practice, but also bring practice into the theory? Um, there are a number of different kind of strands of work that are taking on principles of decolonization, looking at interculturalism, looking at feminist approaches and applying them in new and different ways that I think is a very rich and fruitful area. And I think it merits kind of greater investigation. And the idea, as everybody has talked about this kind of the value and growth of interdisciplinarity, um, the question that is currently um, coming up for me in one of the pieces of work that I'm doing, which is arising out of this collaborative practice, is in cultural ecologies research, which is the question of how do you define the terms of that interdisciplinarity? How do you, how do you theorize the boundaries of it? Because there's a fear that you end up becoming a little bit too scattered, that you become too fluid, that you become um, too random in your selections and choices. And I think there are lots of questions around how we think about multidisciplinarity, interdisciplinarity, transdisciplinarity that maybe are have greater uh, potential, but also some questions around kind of thinking about how we manage that, that relationship. But I think generally we're looking at increased understanding that there are convergent influences that we maybe have fractured as a result of kind of internal institutional structures that have pushed people into departments and schools. And increasingly we're looking at that disassembly um, into kind of a, maybe a different or more modern academy. Um, the relationship between academia and practice, I think, makes us rethink what we think about in terms of expertise. So because I continue to do these consultancy roles as an academic, I think I, we have to adopt a certain amount of reflexivity in that, is that what am I doing when I'm being a, con a consultant? What am I doing when I'm being an academic? How do I step in and out of these roles? And how do I make these two roles be mutually informed? Um, and also keep a degree of kind of distance from um, some of the, the kind of the push, the driver of consultancy work. How do I bring practice into not just research, but also teaching in terms of how does it influence the way in which we teach subjects and think about the role of practitioners and practitioner knowledge. And more generally, I think we have large kind of ethical questions, which is to look at the power, the power of uh, universities, the power of the academy. Um, to what extent are we researching for change? And what, what is it that we have a moral obligation? What moral and ethical drivers underpin the work that we do that are trying to kind of influence social change, policy change, and economic change, whether we are working in archival work or working in different aspects of humanities or medical humanities, digital humanities, creative practice research. I think we have kind of bigger questions to think about, about whether what we are doing is relevant in terms of um, what it, kind of change we are provoking, if it, even if it's simply by reinforcing and restating the value of the practice that we are doing. Um, 
the other aspects of kind of moral and ethical drivers are to think about who we research, how we research and why. Um, so I think I've kind of covered all I was going to cover. Back to you, Neve. My apologies for my slides. Not at all, Ali. It's wonderful. And thank you so much to our four speakers this morning. Um, it is it is tricky, I suppose, to um, you know, give us this insight into the depth and richness of your research, um, but you've all done it um, so so very well. So thank you very much in, in such a, a short space of time. Um, but I think you've given us a real sense of where you're situating yourself. And I think it's very helpful for the doctoral research community to have a sense of the fact that it's continuously ongoing. It's always something in flux. You're always repositioning and repositioning yourself as the world changes and as um, the uh, and as the research needs uh, change um, in the world that we're living in. And as we found out this past year, they can change so quickly um, and completely kind of redefine what it is that we're thinking about. Um, I am just going to keep an eye on the chat. If people have questions, um, please do pop them into the chat and I can read them out. Um, it would be brilliant to hear from you. But just while you're typing, I might, I suppose, start by asking an, a general question to the panel. Um, as doctoral researchers, and we've all been there, you become very, you're very embedded in your research question. And that's, that's to be expected to a certain extent. You're really thinking into your disciplinarity. You're thinking into your discipline space. You're trying to find what, where you sit within that discipline and you're trying to understand what is the particular contribution that your work is making in that disciplinary space. And that's really important, I think, in terms of research um, practice at a doctoral level. You're, you're building out that frame for yourself and your own kind of scholarly identity. And yet we can see a really emerging paradigm now around interdisciplinarity, where we're asking people then to also leave that disciplinary space or have the confidence to take that disciplinary knowledge and see where it fits in and, and connects to these much broader research questions. Um, and we can certainly see that. And um, some of the, the doctoral researchers um, can um, might be interested in understanding the, uh, or having a look at the Shape ID project, which is run from uh, Trinity College Dublin around interdisciplinarity. So I would, I would really recommend that as a great place to start. But I just wonder if, if the panel have any um, comments on uh, how you can take those first steps into interdisciplinarity? What are the practical moves that you can make as a researcher? So, um, Tim, I might come to you first, since you've had a good rest there uh, as you were the first. Uh, uh, yeah, you've woken me up again. Um, no, I look, I think there's, I think it's not just the responsibility of the researcher necessarily. I think, it, you know, some of this depends upon how we within the academy set up research projects. Um, we can begin interdisciplinarity from the start um, by identifying a particular theme that might be uh, that might cross different humanities disciplines, or that indeed might cross the the arts, uh, humanities, and the sciences. Um, I know that we're starting to do that more and more in Trinity here, and we have PhD researchers who are based in English and neuroscience, for instance. Um, I think as a as a researcher who is, I, I understand what you're saying about the pressure to establish yourself within the discipline. I mean, that's the, the PhD research is very much based around that. Um, I think, you know, once you acquire expertise, then you can begin to seek out others who might, um, who might approach your concerns from different disciplines. Um, and I think once, certainly within the environmental humanities, once you start taking the environment as your theme or your matter of concern, then it's inevitable that you're going to have to speak with scientists, those in the political sciences, for instance, uh, with botanists, with people across the university and, and outside of the university. So um, I guess my response is then that the, the establishment of your own discipline is not necessarily um, an obstacle to interdisciplinarity. I mean, you have to speak from a discipline in the first place. But I think we can do a lot more in the university to actually begin yeah. to set up research projects. That... I, I think, yeah, I, I agree. And I think there's also, I suppose, that kind of cross humanities interdisciplinarity as well, that it, does, it doesn't always have to involve, um, you know, uh, and I think 
um, was it who was speaking about the collaboration um, Ali with with an ethnomusicologist? You know that you have that cross um, cross uh, humanities um, interdisciplinarity that 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 counts as interdisciplinarity. It's not always kind of going over um, to the sciences. We just have a couple of minutes left, so I'm going to actually turn to the questions that we have um, from our doctoral candidates because they're the ones we want to be hearing from. Um, I want to take Rosemary Kelly's um, point first. And I think this is a really, really interesting and important question for humanities researchers. In a world of extreme change and not all of it positive change, how can humanities scholars adapt to our fields being used for extremist ideologies? Um, and I know this is something that I've seen in, in medieval studies, for example, um, uh, which you know is, is very challenging, I think. So I, I, does anyone have, um, Kira? I might come to you on that question, um, if that's okay. Or do you have any thoughts on that? Um, so with that easy question, um, I just to follow on from the last one. I, I really do think that we, that when you're kind of earlier in your career, you need to become a bit more sure-footed um, in your own discipline first before you can actually spread out to others and kind of, you have to grow into your discipline as well. Um, ours is a slower burn. And, you know, um, and I think that that's where collaboration can be quite useful. Um, and, you know, if you're, say, for example, working in the medical humanities, I've collaborated with um, uh, Brendan Kelly. He's a psychiatrist, a professor of psychiatry at Trinity, uh, superb to work with and, uh, and others. You can actually, and Tiziana Margaria is a computer scientist. You have to be able to lean on one another's expertise. And for students, to, don't do it too early, but there are ways in which you can actually go to conferences and build your networks in that way. Um, with regards to um, the question of your work being used for to, to kind of shore up extremism, like I, I mentioned how Sirsha was being used for daft things, like as you can imagine, a song called Sirsha, it goes kind of a bit dark and, um, I've seen it crop up in crazy places, but that's where we need to kind of speak up every now and again, but also don't take it all upon yourself either. You need to kind of come in behind uh, more senior scholars who will go to bat for you. Um, I wouldn't like to see a pylon on an early career scholar in say med in medieval studies or the Irish slave meme, which crops up in you know, awful places, which is can be completely debunked. It's a, a false ideology, but um, you can only combat fake news with actual critical uh, research analytical skills and, and a very clear argument. But it really, uh, to use an Americanism, it's a whack-a-mole situation. And just um, if you do find yourself in a, in a situation whereby your work is being used in, a, in an adverse way, you, you need to go back to your community. And particularly if you're early career, you talk to your, your mentor, your supervisor, your head of department, or somebody that you trust to maybe get a bit, a bit of advice on that one. Don't go it alone, because I think that that's, uh, that's where uh, those extremists love to find us. That's really helpful advice. Thank you so much, Kira. And I think that's, that's absolutely right. I think we've seen um, some fantastic research responses and thinking of Anthea Butler's um, uh, humanities uh, keynote address that she gave in Trinity, I think two years ago, was a brilliant example of standing up against that kind of extremism, but from that position of, you know, I suppose we all have to protect ourselves as well, you know, um, and, you know, Donal, you're a researcher of, of Twitter, and I'm sure you see the, you know, some of the you know the darkness that can that can happen and the real um you know difficulty that people can find themselves in we have um mel is telling me we have five minutes to wrap up um i wonder do we even have five minutes um but if we do we've got some fantastic questions um so just uh, just to let people know as well if you want to kind of introduce yourselves we can't have the the coffee break which is a real shame but um just patricia gibson um talking about her research in ed tech um, taking a transdisciplinary approach um, and the philosophical stance to frame ethical issues and computing. Maybe Patricia, you might be really interested in connecting in with uh, Donald's research group. Um, a question here, how can the humanities deal with feelings of futility around the, cri the climate crisis? Um, and I might actually um, ask Ali to take that one if you don't mind, because, you know, I suppose your work in many ways is looks at um, ideas of resilience, looks at ideas of creativity, looks at ideas of kind of future focus, um, I might ask you to take that one. Yeah, um, I suppose, like everybody, th there are certain moments where you're sitting going, why do I even bother? 
Um, why don't we just all give up? And I suppose the question is, well, what is it you want to happen? So um, I suppose the question, that's the question I would ask back. What is it, what is it you, act, you want to happen and what is it you feel you can, you can do? Um, what are the ways in which you think about whether your research is going to fit with a particular, I mean, that's, a, you know, it's a world agenda that everybody should be concerned with. And the question is, is this, is this something that your research is leaning towards naturally? Or is it something that it's simply guiding certain life values? And I think we have to make these decisions and think very carefully. Just to all, just also to echo what Kira's comment to the last question and, and, the, and the previous questions were, um, the idea of not necessarily trying to go things alone is sometimes what I what I have really loved about the, the research community is how willing people are to have the time to sit around a table and ponder a problem. So posing a question of how do we do this is gather, you know, gathering people together and asking that question is actually very often a really effective way of, of doing, of having a response and having an effect. Um, and the work that, that I particularly have done with um, Janus, um, what's come up is because he has come from an anthropological and ethnomusicology perspective, his practice, his discipline, the way in which he comes to knowledge is very, very different to the kind of more management studies driven kind of theories that I come from or the knowledge of cultural production, which would be very heavily informed by cultural studies. Um, and so you have, we were able to pull together different kind of theorizing. And when we were developing some work, we joined a round table with lots of other people with lot, who were mainly cultural geographers and kind of cultural economists. And just having that group of people in a room asking questions about the research actually has created an interesting result. So maybe one of the ways of doing it is thinking kind of work within your, within your capacity, but also think about how do we gather a community that deals with these things collectively. Thanks, Ali. And um, there's a great question here as well from um, Danielle, um, who's talking about coming to the doctoral journey from an industry practice background and shifting that thinking from practice to, to focusing on theory um, and that relationship to um, practice and theory. Um, and just, I know that we're over time and Mel, um, I'll be killed by Mel now for, for keeping going, but I just want to, to give Donald the final word. Donald, do you have any thoughts on that or any thoughts on, on the, the questions? And again, you know, we're, we're kind of rushed this morning, but just remember this is our, the first, I hope, of many opportunities for us to all to connect. So if we don't get to all your questions, hopefully we'll, we'll, we'll have more time at the next one. So Donald, I'll just hand over to you. I'd be very happy for anyone to get in touch as well and to, to pick up some of these topics. I'll, I'll very briefly say that um, it can seem intimidating at first, as, as lots of things do. The, the imposter syndrome never really goes away completely at, at any stage. And, and uh, we're, we're talking now about getting into those rooms where you have those energizing chats with people, where the, the kind of the, the paradigms of other disciplines help inform yours and help reshape your work. But getting in that room in the first place is the problem for a lot of people, is, is thinking about how do I get to that conference or how do I, I build that network. One of the things that I'd say there is start within your own institutions and create it if it's not there. I mean, the IDRG, which BCU started and which we're very lucky to now have inter-institutional um, participation in, was, was started really thanks heavily to the work of a brilliant PhD student, Clark Powers, who, who may be here today, who, who I have, who's, who I'm supervising and, and I think is, is fantastic, but he really was instrumental in starting that up and you can be in your own institutions too. start reading groups or start small groups that you know for a zoom coffee that brings together some different perspectives and some, some people from not just immediately your own school but uh, you know wh whom you know through the, the the networks that you have already socially for um for postgraduate work and very quickly that will snowball and very quickly you'll find the commonalities in terms of your approach there that you'll build out from and that you'll you'll get those new perspectives and a lot of that networking is just taking the plunge initially yourself to to try and start it up of course there's conferences of course there's other things and please join our drg but the grassroots stuff that you build yourself can really help you and the new perspectives you get will absolutely be invaluable to your own work absolutely and tim do you want to pop in there you're just on mute um great yeah, just to follow up on what Donald and Ali have said, if you'll allow me to make a pitch for an event that, the, that our working group has organised, which I forgot to mention before. So in, in May next year, we're organising a network event called Humanities for the Anthropocene. You can find details of it on the homepage of the Irish Humanities Alliance. Um, and again, I mean, 
you really do begin to feel once you move out of your own discipline or you move out of your own research and you begin to find kind of common cause with a lot of other researchers across different disciplines to follow up on what Annie was saying, then I think you those feelings of futility begin to fall away. Um, anyway. I would, I would also just as one last thing just to add with the um, the questions around how you take go from practice backgrounds, what I would really encourage people to do is to read around that idea of kind of ins insider and reflexive researchers. There's a lot of literature out there. I'm more than happy to kind of share stuff, but it, it's actually a very interesting kind of territory to get into to kind of it helps you kind of question your own assumptions and biases and can actually reveal quite a lot of interesting new knowledge. Absolutely. And we have another question there from um, Preya. I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. And um, it's such an interesting question about media and gender studies and biases. And maybe that's a really interesting um, topic for our next our next event. We might even think of that as a topic, maybe that relationship between professional or kind of other identities and research identities and maybe those issues then in terms of, of um, um, in terms of media and gender studies. So thank you very much. Um, I, I just want to finish up, but um, the the points I think that have really come out really strongly is that, you know, think about the change that you want to make. I think that's a really fantastic point. Be brave in terms of going out there, putting yourself in spaces that um, you feel are going to support your work. Go to the conference, join the Association of Medical Humanities for Fiverr. Like these are the networks that will support your, your future work. I think I love doing those points that kind of everything starts with a conversation. Um, it doesn't have to be a big international organization. It can be, you know, you as a group of students sitting down and deciding to have a reading group. That That is how everything starts. You know, I think that those are so important um, things to remember because it, ultimately, you know, we are at this point, I think, of huge, um, you know, sectoral change, I think, in terms of how we think of research, how we think of the humanities, how we think of what it is that we do why we're doing it and who we're doing it for at a time of such change. And that, that is so exciting, I think. Um, but, you know, you are very much going to be the people who will be leading out that change and who will be working in that changed environment. So I think that those kind of very practical steps in terms of thinking about your own agency um, and what it is that you can do is, is really helpful. So just a huge thank you to all of you for your questions. Um, it's been brilliant to get your, your engagement. And, um, you know, as I said, we just wish we could be having the watery coffee now and the the little uh, packets of biscuits. Um, but thank you so much to Ali and to Donal, uh, to Tim and to Kira and to Mel as well uh, for this morning. And hopefully we'll see you um, at 11.45 uh, in our next Zoom room. So there's a second link for that other Zoom room, but thanks a million everybody and we will see you after the break. <laughs>